Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Henry. Welcome to uh, Lincoln Centre and welcome, of course, especially to Summer Forum. It's, it's a real honour and a privilege for us to have all of you here today, uh, especially, I think, to be in the presence of educators. Um, one of the things which is at the heart of, of what we care about at Lincoln Centre, but of course what the art stands for more broadly, is the importance of, of education, um, of, of taking the best of the arts and sharing them with the most people we can. That was the original founding vision of Lincoln Centre when it began uh, back in, in the, you know, the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, when the vision began to emerge of Lincoln Centre. There was an idea that John Rockefeller had of sharing the best with the most. This idea that we take the very best and we share it with the, the very most. The idea that the arts are not peripheral to our lives, they're not something that are simply for people of wealth or means, but they are more than that. They are a human right, they're something which belong to all of us. And, and we as an institution, along with all of you, along with many others, have been fighting that, that fight for many decades, right? We never seem to win that battle. You know, generation after generation comes along again, and yet again a new group of people have to step up and make that case for the arts. And every single one of you in this room today are the people who are making the case for the arts. And we at Lincoln Center, when you think about what it means to be a center, it means that sometimes you get to be in the middle of something. And there's nothing we are proud of, of being in the middle of, than, than this community. So you are also very welcome here at Lincoln Centre, whether you have come two stops on the subway or whether you have come from the other side of the world, please think of this as home. Um, I'm new to this job, I've been in this job for, to, for two months now. And uh, <laughs> thank you, yeah. We <clears throat> off to a very good start. Um, the, so I've been in the job for two months and uh, as you might imagine, a, a, a lot of people have been very impressed. Um, you know, you're president of Lincoln Centre, it's really cool. So a lot of people have been, have been really impressed. There's one person who has not been impressed, which is my five-year-old daughter, uh, Callie. Uh, Callie has, has not been very impressed by, by Lincoln Centre. Uh, she, she kind of, she gets it, she's excited she's been here, but it hasn't got her excited in the way that other things do until today, um, that I finally managed to impress my five-year-old daughter because I said, guess what I'm doing this week? And she said, what? And she said, I'm gonna be talking to Miss America about the arts. <laughs> So she finally has decided that Papa's new job is cool. Um, and and, and it, of course, I, I know that all of us here, it's, it's a real pleasure to have uh, someone with us today, Nia Franklin, who, uh, who is of course the current um, Miss America, but uh, of course has a story which has a big Lincoln Center part of it. She was a Keenan fellow at Lincoln Center. Uh, yeah, quite right too. <laughs> um, she's a Keenan fellow at Lincoln Center. And I'll go, I'll, I'll go a, step, uh, a step further than that. She's, she's also one of us in, in, in that case that I'd laid out, that case for the arts that is made time and time again. Um, one of the main reasons she was selected as Miss America was because of the passionate case she made for the real role of the arts in a changing world. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome her to the stage and to have a conversation with her and with you about what the arts mean to all of us and, and, and what they might mean for the world. So ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my great pleasure uh, and it's really gonna impress my daughter to welcome to the stage, <coughs> Nia Franklin, Miss America. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having we me. We had this amazing event at the uh, New York Philharmonic uh, recently called Fill the Hall, which was the fill was thinking about how they invite people of all different backgrounds to spend time yeah. to enjoy a concert. And it was a room full of um, uh, emergent first responders, um, people working in the schools, teachers. It was a community of people from all over New York sharing their time. And uh, of all the things I've seen at Lincoln Center, there was a moment in that performance when you saw a community of people, you, you introduced the performance, you welcomed everyone to the stage. There was a moment there where two things came together that, that seemed to me kind of at the heart of certainly what we're trying to do at Lincoln Center. Um, and I think what the arts do more broadly, which is they bring together both the great moment of creativity and culture, but also a sense of real community, where they tie those mm -hmm. two things together. Absolutely. Um, and so I think one of the things I really want to talk about with you today is, I think many people will get the Miss America piece, but many people <laughs> may not have the whole, the whole backstory. So I wanted to kind of yeah. begin, um, you know, back at the start, you, were, you grew up in North Carolina. Yes. Um, everyone in this room has a moment when they kind of have that aha moment with the arts, that first moment that the arts kind of either tap you on the shoulder or grab you by the neck, right? And both those things tend to happen. Um, what was your aha moment with the arts? When did it kind of begin? Ooh, there's so many, there's so many, but one of the ones that I 
vividly remember is I grew up in church and singing in the church choir, very active doing that. And that was kind of where I found my love for music. And eventually that led to me finding a love and appreciation for arts in general. But there was a moment where I was singing a solo and I was probably about five or six years old. And it was actually um, during service. And I just remember, so there's two kind of to juxtapose this. There was a little girl that was a little younger than me, maybe four, five, four and a half. And she was just staring at me in amazement. And it just made me feel so good that somebody a little younger than me was so intrigued by this solo that I did in church. And then probably about two years later in third grade, I was um, the finale of my talent show that year in elementary school. And I sang this hymn called The Old Rugged Cross and I was wearing a white dress and I received a standing ovation. And to me, it felt like I really just brought people together. And that feeling is something I've wanted to keep chasing my whole life. And so from that moment, that's when I really knew no matter what I do in life, it's going to be, the arts are going to be involved in that. I mean, that's something that was, was, was encouraged. You think about a lot of people, one of the things everyone in this room thinks a lot about is um, those people who have the blessing of encouragement, right? That the yeah. arts are given to them, mm. not even as a gift, just as a breath, of, uh, like, like the air that you breathe. There are some people who are born and they're surrounded by the arts as if it's just oxygen. There are other people who are starved of that, right? Who don't yeah. get the arts in their world. Yeah. What, what was your experience of that? Well, I feel like for most of my life, I was in a little bubble almost. Yeah. You know, I had, I had chorus when I was in elementary school. I was in band in middle school. My parents could, you know, put, put their pennies together and, and help me pay for piano lessons or voice lessons eventually in high school when I started studying classical voice. Went through college. I went to East Carolina University for undergrad and decided to go straight into my master's program for music composition. And my last year in grad school, I decided to join an organization under AmeriCorps that on our campus, the subcategory or the suborganization was, was Artist Corps. And Artist Corps, basically what it does, the, the, the meaning behind it and what the purpose was, was to take college students and we were going out to underserved communities, underserved schools, Title I schools, which in North Carolina, Title I schools, those, school, those are the schools that half or more of the students are on free or reduced lunch. And so that's how that is classified. And preschools as well. And so I decided to join this organization and going into the schools that had no music, no arts, no dance, it was really heartbreaking and what I ended up doing is creating curriculum for the students so they could have music in their, in their curriculum. So I taught music at a preschool where they had no musical instruction and I just saw such a big difference. I mean, I went from seeing kids who had very little attention spans, some of them had really bad attitude problems, and you could just tell they were just not having that much fun in school. And so between the year that I started, the, the first month that I started and the last month that I was there, a world of difference. And I was just so grateful for that experience because had I not been an Artist Corps member, I wouldn't have really gotten to experience how underserved some communities are when it comes to having the arts. Yeah, and then so tell me about music composition. So you've made, made that choice. What was, the, what was the, the moment that you thought that was the right direction for you next? Yeah, so I've been a songwriter my whole life. I wrote my first song when I was five years old. <laughs> uh, now, we, now we have to know what it is. Okay, so that you, if you... Are, are we going to sing you, it? Are we going to sing it? We can sing it. Yeah, good. So if you followed me... This is me, a room of performers. Prob we're, we're probably in no state. one in here follows me, but if you did, I released this song, actually. I recorded it, and it was actually... Um, for two weeks, it was exclusively av available on the Miss America website, and all the funds um, were going to the Children's Miracle Network Hospital, which I'm the national ambassador for. And... Yeah, so we did that, but the song's out there. It's not streaming right now. You had to catch the exclusive. Uh, but I guess, we can, I, guess, I guess we can do it now. We're gonna, I think we should. Because it's not, for, it's not for sale anymore. So. Th this is an exclusive live experience. <laughs> this is the defense of the live experience. So I was in my grandmother's living room at about five years yeah. old. I guess five was a great year for me. <laughs> and You peaked very early. <laughs> I know. And so I was kind of some hot summer day, and it just kind of came to me. I don't know. I was just like... Love, 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 love is the only thing that matters to me. Hey, 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 hey. 
So that was the chorus. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't I actually didn't write any verses to it, but I had the chorus. And so for that, that charity song that we did, I added two verses to it and a little vamp. And it was, it was really cool to be able to do that and give it kind of back to um, an organization that really helps kids get better that are sick. Wow. All right. That really wasn't exclusive. All right. Well, thank you for that. So, thank you. So things are... Um, you know, you're finding your passion, you're, you're following your path, you've, you've, you've lived in this, in this bubble, you've had access to music and things are, composition is going in the right direction. And then the world changes, right? Yeah. So tell us, tell us about that. And you mean the world changes because of what happened yeah. when I won? Yeah. Kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so composition, I decided to major in that because I had been a songwriter my whole life, written over 100 songs and more to date but I wanted to learn how music worked. Like I wanted to know the science behind it. I mean, I mentioned that I grew up in church singing hymns, but I didn't know how to play that. I didn't know how to sight read until probably high school is when I started learning how to sight read. And so I decided I wanna be able to do more with music than just write songs. I want to be able to orchestrate and didn't even know that honestly, there were female composers that existed or that people were actually writing like symphonies. I, I mean, I thought these were things that were written years ago and we just kind of re, rearranged them or mm -hmm. something. I didn't know people were really out here writing brand new compositions, especially women. I just didn't fathom that. And so when I decided to major in composition, I was actually watching the behind the scenes documentary of Shrek the Musical, which has some really beautiful music in it. And I saw people writing and I saw a woman writing music and that just that was kind of like another aha moment where I said wow this is something I can do and that from from that point on I made it a goal of mine to get into school and that's when I started studying classical voice because that was my instrument of choice while in school studying and you know ever since winning Miss America it's been a challenge to write because I'm traveling so much but I found that just taking 10 minutes a day to write and work on a project and and also pushing myself by reaching out to colleagues and saying hey I'm going to write something would you be interested in playing it it it, it makes you it makes you accountable mm -hmm. um and that's something that no matter what your passion is we all get busy we all have jobs and mine is full time and it really never stops I mean emails pop up things change appearances and events come in at the last minute sometimes but having people to hold you accountable, whether it's friends that are in your same field or even um, even accepting things that might challenge you. I, I've accepted a commission that will premiere in at the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. And so being able to challenge myself in new ways um, has been really rewarding. And having the job of Miss America has challenged me in a lot of ways too. We were talking earlier about being in the in the public eye and and how you don't want, you, you have to kind of be careful not to make mistakes and that sort of thing. But it, it really just grounds you and it helps to humble you as well. I, I'm sure. And then talk a bit about <laughs> one of the things I think is, is, is really intriguing about you and must have been fascinating is, you know, Miss America has kind of turned a corner, right? So there's kind of Miss America, you are the first Miss America 2.0, which is thinking about making a very different set of value statements about what Miss America stands for. And of course, you're a very serious um, musician and composer. And there are those people who, when they first think of Miss America, wouldn't immediately think of serious composer, <laughs> yeah. right? That isn't going to be the immediate go-to no. in their mind. <laughs> no. and, and there must have been some kind of thought in your mind of thinking, okay, the, the, obviously being a Miss America will bring with it all these amazing opportunities, mm. but there's also going to be, there's some kind, it will, it will pr put some kind of filter on how people think about your work as a, as a composer. How do you think about that balance, resolving that, dealing with that? Yeah, I think, for one, I could not have won Miss America at a better time, at a, in a better year, because we're rebranding, um, we we are in a new era. In tw in January of 2017, there was new administration brought on, and it's kind of just changed so much in just two year, almost two years. One big change is that we've eliminated swimsuit competition, and um, <laughs> yes, and it's a little controversial within the. Uh, the community of, of longtime Miss America supporters. But I'm so glad they made the change because it's, I know for a fact that back to people wondering like, Miss America, composer, I don't think people have that much of a hard time digesting that now. That's one reason. And also during the show this year, I didn't have to compete in swimsuit to win Miss America, but I also was able to speak more. We, we had two on stage questions this year. We were actually supposed to have three, but 
time was running a little long and it was a two hour show. But the first question was about, you know, how to how do you empower women to be confident in themselves? And I talked about, you know, growing up, I went to a minority school, but the arts helped me to feel confident about myself. And on the days where, you know, I was around mainly girls with long flowing hair and my hair was curly and, and shorter, that when I went into music class, I didn't care about that. And my mind was focused on the right things, not just the appearance of how I looked. And also, I, my second question was about, Nia, as the candidate from New York, what do you have to bring to the table that will help you be a great Miss America? And my answer was, I have New York grit. I moved to New York in 2017 on a Lincoln Center Education Fellowship, and it's pushed me. It's it's motivated me. It gave me the strength that I needed to be able to do this job. And with this new era of Miss America, you need New York grit because there's so many changes. We haven't even publicly announced the date of our of our competition this year. And so you have to be prepared, you have to be flexible, and that's something that New York definitely teaches you. So tell me a bit about the, um, I think it's, I'm not certain of this, but I think it's true that you're probably the first Lincoln Center fellow to become Miss America. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, I am. We, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> which, which we're very proud of. Tell us a bit about your, your, your fellowship, the Keenan Fellowship. Oh my gosh. What, what, it, what it meant, uh, what you learned from it, what we can learn from your experience. Yeah, it's really the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, I used, I kind of talked about Lincoln Center in my like winning answer for Miss America. And I don't think, I, I truly do not think that I would be sitting in this seat if I didn't have this, the fellowship with Lincoln Center. Obviously because I wouldn't be Miss America, but also I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't have ever probably come to New York, especially, especially at that time. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, you can compete for Miss America only one time. And you win your state and you go and that's it. But you can compete for any state as long as you're eligible. So from 17 to 25, you can compete. It used to be 24, but with the new administration, they actually, or right before the new administration came in, they raised the age by one year. So I actually competed for Miss North Carolina for two years. And the second year that I lost Miss North Carolina, I uh, moved to Lincoln Center about a day later, just drove up and started my fellowship. <laughs> and... A few months later, I had got a call that they raised the age limit for Miss America, and it was actually in September. And I was like, oh, Miss America, I'm, I'm not really feeling it anymore. I have Lincoln Center. And, it was, and I was really focused. <laughs> Who on, needs Miss America <laughs> when you have Lincoln Center? I mean, I was, I was really focused on my fellowship here, and, and I just didn't give that a second thought. It was kind of like I put it behind me. But after the fellowship was over, I was working full time at Success Academy um, in their administrative, doing administrative duties. and. I just kind of thought, you know, Miss America, I did have a really great experience there. Um, and I believe everything happens for a reason. And who knows that if I never competed in Miss America, if I would even be here. So I decided to compete again. And I think it's all full circle. But what I loved about my time at Lincoln Center as a Keenan Fellow is just the, the way that my appreciation for the community around arts grew. I was able to shadow a teaching artist and I was able to visit different parts of New York and see how Lincoln Center brought the arts into different parts and how that was perceived. And it was always amazing to see how much the community responded and how well they responded. I mean, doing events in Brooklyn where we had kind of a park, a park activity and there were like there was a, a band playing and there was like there were snacks and things like that. Just bringing that to areas that would never have it was just so inspiring for me. And I just really commend Lincoln Center Education for what they do here and how they inspire other artists to go out and take that little piece of what they're teaching and they're trying to do in New York and take it back to wherever they are. And so, you know, this year's Miss America, my, my social impact initiative is actually advocating for the arts. And so it's just been really great to take little things that I've learned from Lincoln Center about how to engage and how to turn the conversation that when you're talking with the administrators who may be, are like, why should I even have arts in my school this year? Or when you're talking to kids that they would rather play sports and they don't see any value in the arts. When I'm able to kind of use some of the information that I've learned here and talk about why it's important, that's what's been so rewarding for me. And that's why I really, it was only a six month fellowship, but it just, it really, it's a gift that keeps on giving. And there's so much that I, I will continue to learn from that experience. Well, we're, it, it makes us all very proud as you might imagine. So tell, tell us a bit about something you're working on now, which is, <clears throat> is much on our minds here at Lincoln Center 
is uh, female composers, female composers, yes. uh, and, and, and in, encouraging uh, and supporting and getting behind that in thoughtful ways. Um, the the New York Philharmonic just announced a, a program called Project 19, mm. which is a, a 19 new commissions from female composers to celebrate the anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And so I think you know there, there is a, a swing towards encouraging this. Tell, tell us about why how you think we can move the needle and, um, and what, what you're thinking about in that space? Yeah, I think it really is all about awareness. Like I said, from personal experience, I didn't just, I just didn't understand at a young age that I could be a composer. It didn't even seem like a possibility to me. So my goal when I am going to different schools and I'm talking to different heads of, of whether it's symphonies, um, different opera companies and institutions, I really am urging them to make sure they're connecting with not only musicians and, and different people they want to engage with in their communities, but also little girls out there who may not know that this is a path for them. And little boys too. I mean, had I been a boy, maybe I wouldn't have known about composition at a young age either. But as I kind of grew up and was going into my field, I realized that A, there's not that much, there's not really a network uh, where we can, there's not a, a strong place or institution where I can say, wow, if I go here, I know I can be supported by other women. That we, I, we, that we don't really have that, especially not nationally. And, and also, I just know that I've been discouraged a couple of times mm -hmm. throughout my career as a female composer, and I know I'm not the only one. And, you know, I can count on my hand how many African-American composers that I know, let alone female ones. And that's a problem. That's something I want to change. I want to inspire other, other people that are coming up, whether they're in college or whether they're in elementary school. I want to inspire them to know they can do this. When I was auditioning for undergraduate schools, I remember going to one of them in the wintertime and I, was, I had one of my compositions up and we were kind of looking through it and talking about my style and that sort of thing. And I remember the person saying, you have the same, looking at my stuff, saying you have the same chance of being a composer as an NFL football player. And I had a lot of resilience back then. I mean, if somebody were to say that to me wow. today, I think I would just be crushed. I don't yeah. know. But, you know, as a 17-year-old, I was like, oh, whatever. That's just one opinion. And I'm so glad that I had yeah. that attitude. But what about people that might have that kind of discouragement that don't have that attitude? Who are they going to turn to? And so that's, I'm, I'm developing something, an institution, organization, a network called Compose Her that I really want to serve as a place where women can come together and be able to feel like they have that support that I didn't always have. Uh, terrific. Um, well, we, I, you know, it's funny when you think about that. I was thinking when you were talking about being five years old, one of the, the, the interesting thing is with the arts and education in general is actually children, children are born composers largely mm. actually and then we talk them out of it right <laughs> so actually you know you, uh, you, five five three-year-olds four-year-olds five-year-olds they, they will sing they will make yeah. up songs they will create they will yeah. compose and then at some point <laughs> someone comes along or the world comes along and says no 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 mm. that's that's yeah. not for you right so we yeah. actually have to one of the interesting challenges in arts education is how we talk people back in to being composers there was a good i used to work at the 92nd street y mm -hmm. on the east side and and one of the one of the seniors we had a big senior program there at the y and we had a, a very good early childhood program. So we focused mm -hmm. a lot on kids, um, new moms and, and, and new dads and zero to five was a big focus of ours. And someone said to me, she was, she'd been at the Y for decades. She was part of our senior program. And she said, um, when you look at this, it's so interesting that it helps you understand what life is about. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, if you go and see the kids from zero to for five, zero to six, they're all artists, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. You ask them, they'll tell you they're artists, they're painters, <laughs> they're musicians, they're oh. songwriters, right? They, they're all artists, you see them. Um, and then they, they start being artists at some point. The teenagers mm -hmm. kind of go off it a bit and then grown-ups get further and further away from it and they get busy. And he said, then what? Well, she said, then, she said, then what happens is you go and see the seniors. So the senior program, which is mm -hmm. like six, 65 and, and upwards and very upwards. We have people of 106. And she said, <laughs> all the seniors are artists. So, ah. all, so oh, they spend all their time. You ask them, they'll tell you they're artists, right? They paint, they draw, they compose, they sing. They, they, we, had, we had people taking their first piano lessons at 98, right? Yeah. And, and what she said to me, which I thought was, was, was so right, which is, because, and, and th this is New York, right? So we had in the senior program, there were like great captains of industry and, and people who had run media companies, and these amazingly accomplished people. And what she said is, when you look at the span of life, what you realize is that our careers are essentially just distractions from our lives as artists. Mm. That we begin life, 
and we end life as yeah. artists and all that happens is we get distracted for decades from returning yeah. to what we should be doing in the first place. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to, we'll open up for some, for some questions. I wanted to finish with a question. Um, I, I was one of the things I've been um, thinking a lot about in, when you, you know, you start a new job, you try and, uh, and we're, we're looking forward a lot at Lincoln Center, right? We're thinking about the future. We're thinking about yeah. the kind of issues you outlined today. But one of the ways you try, at least I try and understand an organization is looking back, right? Where did this organization come from? What yeah. was it trying to do? And I found, <coughs> I found something yesterday, which I wanted to read you all, um, which will lead me to a final question, which was, um, so this is, so William Schumann, the composer, mm -hmm. um, who um, was the third president of Lincoln Center. So I'm the 11th, he was the, he was the third. He, he was given a speech in 1967. Um, <clears throat> and this is by him on behalf of Lincoln Center at the Smithsonian speaking to the Kennedy Center. So everyone, <laughs> everyone was collaborating much better back then. Um, so, and, 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 and he, he, gave, he gave this speech and I'll read you the first page. He said this, he said, if there was ever a time in the history of the United States when we, needed to under, to, when we needed to be understood as we really are, that time is now. The need is critical now because never before have we been viewed with such distorted vision. The distortion has come about because the most admirable side of our nature is little known, whilst the crassest side received almost exclusive attention. America is most often pictured as a land of violence, vulgarity, racism, and controversial military actions. The unfortunate result is that the American people are being misjudged the world over. All of our debits are listed in the daily ledger of world opinion, but virtually none of our assets. And amongst these, the one I feel most strongly about is America's unquestionable identity as a land of the arts. Could have written that today, right? Yeah. Think about yeah. the public perception. So the question I wanted to finish with was really one about representation. So you, um, you represent both America to the world, and I go a step further and say you represent the arts to the world. Uh, yeah. And you represent, in, in one sense, the blending together, right, of America and the arts. And mm -hmm. you've, been, you've just come back from abroad. You've, you've traveled a lot with yeah. this job. Um, talk, talk, what does it mean to represent America? It's a huge responsibility. Every day I wake up and sometimes I, I say to myself, wow, I'm, I miss America. Um, because I, I didn't dream of, of this as a little girl. That must girl. happen quite a lot. I mean, there must just be moments you suddenly turn around and yeah. think, hang on. Because I did not dream of this as a little girl. Some people ask me all the time, did you do this since you were like five? Did you do like the teen? No, I didn't do any of those pageants when I was little. And actually, Miss America is no longer considered a pageant, if you didn't know. We're considered a competition now. But I just, I, I'm so blown away that I even had this opportunity to represent. And I think there's so many different things that I represent, which is so cool. And I think we're all so unique and individual and we all have something to bring to the table, no matter who has this position or, or your position. I think it's great that we all have our differences where we can represent something in our own, in our own way. And one way that I do represent America is through the arts. I mean, this year, my huge focus has definitely been advocating for the arts. I've been able to do everything from hosting the New York Philharmonic to being in residence with the Dallas Symphony and singing with their community concerts and even being able to just go to schools one by one and talk to kids and perform for them or you know show them why I love this and why I think they should love it too. And actually later I'm going to be able to go and um, talk about a partnership with the, with the ukulele company and how we can bring more ukuleles to kids across America. And so that's what I want my my legacy to be is that I helped bring arts to places where they wouldn't have been and that I helped to show other people that they, doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your race or your gender, that you can be a composer, you can, you can be taken seriously as a composer no matter what someone's told you in the past. And going to representation, I think an obvious thing is I'm a woman and I'm also a black woman. And I think it's, it's been amazing this year to see how many contestants, how many candidates have <laughs> <laughs> uh, verbiage. How many how many candidates have been of color and who have won this year? There have been I think there's a record number of candidates that are African American and of color. Last year it was definitely a record, but this year I think there's actually more. And I mean I can't help but be happy about that and just and and say wow maybe I was a, a maybe I was a part of that and I hope that I was. And so. I think equality for for everyone is is what I'm interested in, and I'm inspired by artists like Ava DuVernay and 
and Caroline Shaw who really bring their their passion for the arts not only to the public, but they show their hearts and they show what matters to them in a way that's so beautiful. And that's how I hope to represent America. I hope I've done that <laughs> this year so far. Um, I know you have. Um, we're going to open up now for um, some questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Can we, can we put the lights on? It's very, it feels very anonymous. The house lights. I, feel like I can only see Matthew, who I know. And he's lovely, but still. Are there some, are there some more lights so we can see people? Is that, is, that, is that doable? Ah, oh, perfect. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit more about your fellowship? Yes. How that process, how you became part of it? Yeah, yes, please. So it was a six-month fellowship, too short. and You need to make it a year. It's an, in, it's an initial <laughs> six months. It's a renewable term. <laughs> <laughs> really? Didn't, nobody told me that. <laughs> break, break, breaking news. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a six-month fellowship. When I did it, it was. And it's broken up. For, for my term, it's been two years, I'm old now, <laughs> <laughs> but it was broken up into three phases. So the first phase was actually doing this. This is very full circle for me. I wasn't up here speaking. They didn't let me do that back then, but I was actually being very helpful. Uh, we were a team of six. It, are there still six fellows at a time too? So there's six fellows at a time and you have to be from the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. Go Pickles! <laughs> Go Fighting Pickles. Um, so the North Carolina- They're called the Fighting Pickles? Yes. <laughs> and they need to make a pickle emoji for the iPhone. Like, are they working on that? Okay, great. So yeah, it's, it's a joke. We're the Fighting Pickles. Where does the pickle come from? Is it- It's just a joke, like the fight, because we have, there's no sports at, uni in, okay, at UNCSA. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, the first ever public conservatory. And it was, and it's actually in my hometown of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And so I went to school in Greenville, came back and oh, I did grad school at home. And you have to do this fellowship. You actually have to have graduated from the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. And the first phase is you come in the last week of June and you start helping with the logistics of summer forum. We did a lot of preparation, stuffing the packets that you may have and, and helping the teaching artists actually during the sessions and being supportive to them in any way we can and really just getting our feet wet in what Lincoln Center Education does, getting acclimated with aesthetic education and the practices that they, they teach here and that they go out and, and have the teaching artists, um, teaching artists kind of plan out and go into schools and that sort of thing. And, and they basically help, you guys are gonna learn more about this if you don't already know, but basically the teaching artists, they go into schools and they kind of supplement the curriculum with the teacher. So they kind of work on the lesson plans with that teacher and find out what they're doing in their history class or their dance class and they go from there. And so we learned a lot about that during summer forum. And then in August, there's boot camp, which is a really cool program where they take rising eighth graders and they, for two weeks, they whip them into shape so they're prepared for their high school auditions. And I don't remember the statistics, but a lot of these kids get into LaGuardia, which is an amazing high school, Frank Sinatra, a lot of different art schools around New York. And that's the first phase. The second phase, we shadow our own teaching artists. Mine was Sasha Papernick. She's amazing. And I was able to shadow her at a couple different schools, um, John, um, St. John out in Queens and um, also a school down in Battery Park. And I was able to see firsthand how she teaches and, and how she uses the practices of Lincoln Center Education. And then the third phase was really awesome. Um, I, we kind of had to submit a proposal for a show, for a project, an artistic project that we wanted to have performed in this hall in, in Clark Studio. And they usually only took four, there are six fellows, but they only accept, my year they were only accepting four proposals. And so two of my six, two of the six of us submitted a proposal together. Um, and then the other two, the other three, that makes four total. Yeah, the other four, the other three did their own proposal and I did my own proposal. So there were five proposals that were submitted, but they actually accepted all five my year because I really liked them and had the resources to kind of make it work. And my proposal was for basically a show where I displayed my compositions that I had written, songs that I had written, and I did a couple of covers. And it was a way for me to really um, 
become a better performer. I, I spent a lot of time collaborating with artists. I had never done that before in a sense of having, basically creating my own band. I normally just play piano for myself. So it was really cool to, to collaborate with other artists from around New York City and Lincoln Center. And it was really just an incredible experience. Like I said, it was, it was too short. I wish it was a year. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any other questions, please? Um, hi, Ms. Brendan. Hi. Great. Yes. That was so, so awesome. Thank you. The girls really, I think, uh, took some of your grit and grace oh. and uh, mm. really um, just did so much for our school. Uh, Thank you. So Good. Where did you start um, in a middle school uh, with an entree for, for girls and boys uh, with female composers and that kind of a path? There's two cool ways I think you can do this. So A, showing them some sort of musical work, whether it's a musical or a play or even a play that has music in it, and just kind of talking about whether you whether you kind of create the the content yourself, or whether there's a documentary that they can watch kind of to see the backstory on how this was created. Because I think the biggest thing is we see these things as kids, but we don't know where it comes from. We don't know what goes into the production of, of something or even the craft of, of writing your own song. And that leads me to the second point, which is to actually give them some staff paper, which is something that I had never seen blank staff paper until I was probably in my AP theory class, my senior year of high school. I had never seen blank paper. And so just being able to, to sit there and visibly and tangibly see a blank sheet of staff paper, just ask them to write some notes. I mean, there might be a little music theory that has to go into that, but it can also be just a creative way, even if you give them some crayons and let them kind of draw and let them know, you know, this is what music looks like when this isn't blank and kind of let them see how it can become something out of nothing. Mm. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Please. Hi. Hi. Oh, hello. It's so nice hello. to meet you. Thank you so much for everything you do, and you. we're so proud of you. Thank you know, you. Uh -huh. it's really amazing <laughs> just to be like ten feet from you. <laughs> so, um, but I represent uh, New London, Connecticut, and there's a group of teachers here. All we work at an art school, okay, and we are constantly. Um, in front of children that we know and believe that will become these, you know, great individuals. I would just love to, if we're, we're constantly trying to expose them to diverse cultures and diverse uh, populations of artists, you know, and I would love to be able to say to them, you know, we met Miss America. I was 10, 10 feet from her and this is what she says. You know, what could we say to them that you would say to inspire them to be everything they could be. What's their age group? So this is elementary kids. Elementary. And they're five to like 11 or 12. I would just, I would just say to them, don't, don't give up. That's kind of the cliche thing we always say, but remember why, remember as you go through life, remember this moment, remember what you're passionate about, passionate about now and don't, don't lose that. Keep the heart of, of whatever it is, that whatever discipline they're in, if it's dance, music, visual art, the heart of why they're doing this and that feeling, that childlike feeling, keep that. Because that's what's going to help you to stay resilient as the no's come, as, you know, life happens. That's what's going to help them to, to continue on. And that's what I've tried to go back to those moments my entire life. The moment of me in my grandmother's living room writing my first song and not even, even knowing what I was doing, just having fun. And I think if we try to remember the fun of things and the joy, one of those mm -hmm. LCE things you'll learn about, that's one of the kind of principles here is the joy. Remembering that and keeping that will help them to be inspired for the rest of their lives because this is, the, this is that innocent time in their life and um, just never losing sight of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Nia, let me let me uh, let me thank you for being with us today. I thought the the phrase earlier was so lovely for your grit and for your grace. Um, <laughs> it is, is a great honour to have you here. You. And let me thank uh, let me thank 
all of you in the in, in the room you. today for um, for the work that, that you do for for honouring us by spending your days in some case weeks with us over the summer and uh, by being a part of a community of people who are on the same team. Um, I increasingly think as we think about the future of Lincoln Centre more and more we need to work out how we expand this team, how we strengthen this team, how we make sure that, that more people are making a stronger argument more often uh, in a way which is connected and comes from not just the head but also from the heart. Right? That's so much the part of the future of the arts. Um, yeah. It's a great honour to have you here. Thank you for your time. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you.